Yesterday, I officially announced that we had ceased development on Seed of Andromeda and that we wouldn't be developing it anymore, at least not in the near future or in its current form. And naturally, people in the comments requested that we make it open source so that they could take it and build something out of it, continue the project with their own vision and their own passion, or at least learn something from it and use that to build something else. So that's what we've done. We have released all of the code for Seed of Andromeda, all of the assets, everything, uh, the underlying engine, the Vorb engine, uh, which is you know, very immature, but it still has some good stuff in it. All of that stuff is released now for you guys. It's under the MIT license, which basically means you can take it, you can copy paste it, you can re-release it, you can sell it, you can do whatever you want. We, of course, would appreciate if you at least mention that you got it from us, but really the, the goal behind this is just to give you something and, and let you run with it. There's no warranties. The software is just as is. Plenty of bugs, doesn't even compile in Visual Studio 2015, but it's there. It's it's something you can look at. If there's some aspect of this that you like, you can just look at that part of the code and at least learn from it or learn what, what not to do. What I want to do right now is show you sort of the current state of the game. Um, this is a copy downloaded from the website. I'm actually not running a local build because it doesn't compile and I don't feel like trying to get it to compile. That's going to be on you guys. Um, so... What we have here, this is the most recent version. It's like 0.2, negative uh, 1B or something weird. Um, but it's just the star system viewer. Uh, one of the cool things about this engine is, or not the engine, but the, the game, is that it has an entire star system. Um, all of the data was uh, created by George. He made like, he did all the, the math. He's a really smart uh, uh, physics guy. So he, he figured out exactly what he wanted the star system to be, and he designed this entire thing. Um, but it's runs pretty fast. It's, um, it's using a lot of uh, complex shaders for things like uh, star generation um, and star rendering. So you can see like this corona and everything. So you can at least get something out of that, I think. Um, all the planets are procedurally generated and rendered. Uh, there was a time where we were using GPU generation. We eventually got rid of it, uh, deleted it actually in a commit, because once you got down to uh, planet scale, like right when you were standing on the planet, everything started to started to get broken because you normally generate on the GPU with 32-bit precision. 64-bit um, precision just isn't really well supported or very fast. Um, so we, we had to drop it. It ended up making planets look way better with the GPU generation. Um, so I'm going to leave that commit for you guys uh, to try to resurrect that GPU generation and maybe make it work. Um, I do think that you can solve the problem we were having by having a sort of scaled space transition where you only generate the large details at planet scale with the GPU, and then when you get into the close details where you need more precision, uh, you can still use the GPU, but you use it in a scaled space, and you sort of layer the two together, so that you're always uh, using a precision that doesn't have floating point rounding error problems. Uh, but let's let's move on. I don't want to ramble too much uh, in here. Let's actually talk about sort of the main features of uh, the game, or I guess the engine and game, at what you're getting essentially. We have, uh, in VORB, we have an entity component system, which we've used for pretty much only the star system um, and probably didn't even use it right. But uh, the entity component system is like a true entity component system. It uses an integer ID for entities, and then components are just assigned to those. It's not like you have an object and you slot in collections like Unity currently is. Um, it has a math library based on GLM, and honestly, you should just probably delete that math library that I have. It's a lot like GLM because a lot of the code is actually from GLM um, and you should just replace it with GLM. Uh, back uh, back when we made this math library we were using GLM originally and there was a bug uh, with GLM and we were like you know what we're just gonna make our own math library so we don't have to deal with this and that was that was dumb so just put GLM back probably and it'll be better. Um, we have some voxel utilities but they're not very robust in the engine. The voxel utilities that are robust are in Seed of Andromeda which I'll get to. We do have a shader manager which is pretty nice. Um, it lets you load shaders. Hello, kitty. Um, and it also has like an include system. Um, so you can include files at the top of uh, whatever shader file you're working in, like common utility functions, noise, and things like that. Um, super nice. It has its own like parser for loading in the shader and, and doing things to it. I think it had some semantic support as well. Uh, we have render pipeline stuff that I honestly don't remember. We had like this swap swap thing that swaps buffers and I don't know you guys can figure that out uh, we do have a YAML reader it should work um, just fine sorry there's a kitty tail on the, the camera um, 
YAML is what all of our data is pretty much. Um, you'll see a whole bunch of data files in the game data repository, which I will get to as well. Um, and things, everything like biomes and, and uh, terrain generation and all that is specified in that YAML reader. Uh, we have Lua scripting support. We didn't do a whole lot in Lua. We were starting to do like our UI in Lua uh, and we had, I think maybe a couple bits of functionality in Lua, but we, we were still kind of prototyping most of the things in C++. FMOD sound, don't know how well it works right now. Uh, and then I ended up making a UI system later in development based on Microsoft's like .NET UI. Uh, probably want to just replace that with something else because I never really got finished with it. It's functional, but it's not great, I'm sure. You'll look at it and probably not not like it that much, but you know, it, it works. Uh, key features of CD of Andromeda itself. Remember, these are two separate repositories. Vorb is a dependency of CD of Andromeda. It is the engine Seed of Andromeda has real-time planet rendering, which you saw um, pretty fast stuff, especially when it had GPU generation. Here's that commit. Um, I will put this commit in the description um, for you so that you can maybe revert it or look at it and see how it worked. Uh, oh, I don't have access to it, but I'll put it there. Um, let's see, we have fast voxel cellular automata. This is something that's one of the better things in Seed of Andromeda, I think, is... Um, the code for it might be a little bit gross, but it is definitely fast. It's being really cache uh, friendly. It's it's not going to uh, have any problems with like uh, mutex locking because it is single threaded. You could make this kind of a simulation multi-threaded, I think, with some work. Uh, could be cool. But just looking at how that stuff works might be interesting. One of the core reasons it's so fast is because reading and writing voxels in our engine is extremely fast. I say engine, but really just in the Seed of Andromeda game code. Uh, all of our voxel stuff is stored in this dynamic uh, this dynamic object that's called like a smart voxel container or something. And what it does is based on your accesses, uh, it will either swap your voxel data from a fully just flat array. So just a big block of memory, which is good for cache coherency and um, quickly editing data. And it'll switch between that and a... Uh, a um, like a red black tree that's still contiguous in memory. It's still just one block of memory. And this is the compressed version. So it's much smaller than the big flat array. Um, but it's a bit slower to update because it is a tree. You do have to traverse nodes and update uh, indices and sometimes resize the, the memory, but it, it just ends up being a really good data structure. So uh, it has, I think a little bit of missing functionality. It doesn't know how to recompress um, very well on the fly. Like if, if two nodes next to each other, are separate uh, block types, and then you place the same block type there to replace one of them, it won't combine the two nodes. That's something you could probably figure out. Uh, we have fo fast voxel floor generation. Uh, the floor generation, mainly because of that data structure, is really fast. And then the floor code, I basically, when I was writing the floor generation, I was just kind of sitting there, and it all made sense to me. I didn't really make any comments, but I was just like looking at plants online and figuring out what processes would generate those plants without ever really researching how people do planet, planet, plant generation. So it doesn't use like L systems or anything like that. It's my custom just weird floor generator that works fast, makes some cool results, has decent amounts of flexibility. I did do a lot of work in the end uh, adding more support for that. And it loads everything in in, uh, in YAML, but it is it is basically a big list of properties that you change to generate a, a plant. So uh, take it or leave it on that one. <laughs> planet uh, system simulation with proper physics, you saw that. Uh, everything is using real physics uh, formulas to, to simulate. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of bugs there, but it looks cool at least. Um, we do have a thread pool that does um, like uh, all the tasks. It does, does jobs like creating meshes and uh, I think at one point we had had it doing voxel lighting. We actually got rid of voxel lighting, I think, near the end and because of some issues we were having with it. But uh, the reader writer queue uh, is really fast. Um, it's not our our source. You'll see it's it's from somebody else. But uh, it allows us to have really quick multi-threaded job distribution without a lot of like blocking. There's no mutex locks with it. You just pull data off the queue and because it's like an atomic operation, you don't have to worry about uh, any problems there with race, race conditions. Um, we have really, really fast blocky mesh generation, like really fast. It's probably one of the fastest generators for blocky mesh. One of the downsides to it being so fast is I never made it handle T-junctions. 
uh, but it is a single pass mesh generator that can handle connected textures and everything and all all of the it, it can at one point at least it could handle uh, the voxel lighting and it baked ambient occlusion and all that um, so that's something you could look at I'm sure it's poorly commented and confusing but um, it is blazing fast and it runs on a thread pool uh, one of the slowest parts about doing really fast updates for voxel engines at least in my experience has always been the mesh updating so this is what allowed us to do crazy voxel physics all over the place and not really worry about it too much um, lots of cool shaders to look at some of them probably don't work some of them do work i'll show you some of those here in a minute um, we have a connected texture system which unfortunately isn't on anything that we have made available for people to download um, but connected textures are basically um, you have blocks next to each other that are maybe the same type Based on how they're arranged, it'll change the textures on the face to one of like 47 different textures, or maybe I'm remembering that wrong, but um, it gives you a lot more detail. It makes the world feel a lot more alive and less like tiley looking. Everything looks just much better and handles updates a lot better. Um, and then finally, there's plenty of bugs in Cruft, I'm sure, and then it doesn't compile in VS 2015, mainly because of dependencies, I think. Um, and I think my math library also has some problems with it. That's why I maybe just replace it with GLM. Um, if you do replace it with GLM, you'll have to go into the types file because we did our own thing where we like named vector types uh, F32V3 and all these weird names that describe their size. So you'll want to update those uh, type defs to use whatever you're replacing it with, probably GLM. Um, but yeah, if you can get it to compile a VS2015, good job. That's, that's a great first step. Make a pull request or something, get that in there for sure. Um, that's pretty much it as far as like features. I will go ahead and show you um, the version of the game that has blocks since I showed you the version of the game that doesn't have blocks. This is point, uh, 1.6. If you try to load a block world, which I'm, I'm sure you can do building the game locally, um, it's probably going to have like no biome, no trees, no nothing like that. Let's turn down the audio. Uh, and let's load test. I think test is a, it's going to zoom us into the planet here. This is very, very old at this point. So the, you can see there's no connected textures here, sadly, but uh, in the in the version that you will see, um, like on the master branch, these all of these assets are different. It uses a different texture pack. I think it uses SOA alternate, I want to say. Yeah, SOA alternate is the default. Um, and Right now, you'll see there's there's no connected texture stuff going on, but you will if you if you manage to uh, get it working. This this same texture pack has been updated with all of the cool connected textures that Andreas made. Um, so you can edit blocks. There's like particles and, and stuff. Um, really, honestly, the best thing to do is is play with bombs and, and water and all that. So like we can do a water spawner. These are nice. Oh, if you hit U, it will disable Frustum updating. So if everything looks broken, it's because you accidentally hit that button. Uh, and then the water is actually creating a cascading chain reaction with the uh, gravel, because the gravel has physics. Like, when, when a block updates, it will tell its neighbors to update. Um, probably need to, like, make a blog post on, on cellular helmet, because as you can see, we're running really well uh, frame rate-wise, and this is a six-year-old computer. Um, so I, I'm actually excited to see what people can do with newer hardware. Um, you can press G to see all of the chunk states. Uh, I think green means that it is waiting to load. Uh, a chunk, I believe, doesn't load until its neighbors are, are, are in view in memory because it needs neighbor information to properly like generate trees and such. Um, let's see. I will say that the newest version of this game um, that I was currently working on... Oh, look, a bug. I bet that's a chunk boundary. Yeah probably some meshing bugs in this version that are fixed in the, in the version you will see. Um, the chunk system was completely changed in the newest version. Um, I wanted it to be, I think, more multi-threaded, multi-threading, excuse me, <laughs> more multi-threading friendly in the current version. So I, I rewrote all of the voxel uh, chunk management stuff. Not even sure if it really functions anymore, but it's worth taking a look at and seeing if you can make something out of that. Um, as for like shader stuff, you can press, I think it's R. Yeah, you can do R to see this cool shader that does uh, sonar stuff. I think it actually is a component of the main shaders. It's not actually its own shader. So it's not it's not quite a post-process. But in the newest version, we have plenty of post-processes. So um, the cave generation uses a 
3D like ridge to noise function. And as you can see, this is definitely the version that has lighting generation problems. When generating downward, we used to have this problem where light would get screwed up. I believe we did fix that. So eventually we stripped out the lighting altogether. Um, we have physics when you break things. Oh, that's not the right button. It will fall down. Um, what it's actually doing is every time you destroy a block, it's going to do a really fast like depth first search to uh, up to a maximum distance to find out if all the blocks around it are part of a disjoint set, like a disconnected set. And if they find a disconnected set, they will turn all of those blocks into physics blocks and remove them from the world. It ends up being pretty fast somehow, uh, probably just because of how well the memory layout is optimized. Um, but of course, if things generate uh, floating, they'll stay floating until you update around them. Tons of biomes. Uh, most recently, I was working on a bunch of biome changes as well as the voxel stuff. So the way biomes work... Um, probably isn't the same anymore. In fact, I think Aldrin in the newest build um, probably doesn't have any biomes on it. Um, I'd have to figure out what I was thinking when I was reaching, redoing the biome system, but I do remember that the new system was making it much easier to have lots of different biomes uh, and sub-biomes. So you could have like a desert and then with that des within that desert you would have an oasis and those are completely different biomes with different spawns. Um, it, it just let you like recurse essentially uh, and have much more freedom of, of specification for these things. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it for Seed of Andromeda. I'm, I'm sure there's some things I'm missing. I haven't even really looked at this code in years, uh, but it's here for you guys now to learn from or to make something out of it. Uh, and yeah, I am excited to see if you guys can can make something or, or at least learn from it, take it, do something with it. I'd be happy to hear about it, uh, whatever you guys do. Take care and I'll see you next time.